Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Jessica Rubenstein, Director of Admissions here at Pacifica Graduate Institute. We're so glad you can make it. We're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes, but I'd like to share that we have a great program ahead. We have our virtual audience members joining via Zoom. We have some virtual panelists. And then, of course, we have a great program here in person with our honored AAPI speakers, community members, and honorees. So get comfortable. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. And thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you all. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We are all honored to be here with each other. And I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Corian Duvey. I am part of the admissions team here at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, warmly welcome you. So let's start the evening with a moment to honor the Chumash people, the original stewards of this land. <clears throat> Thank you for that. We are excited to host this event as a celebration of the rich culture and history of our Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And to honor our AAPI members who have made significant contributions to the field of depth psychology, mental health, diversity, and service to the community. We have featured engaging talks and panel discussions from leading Asian American and Pacific Islander scholars, therapists, and healers. Tonight, we will be hearing from speakers and a keynote presentation by the Santa Barbara Trust and Historic Preservation Presidio Research Center. We will then have our honoring ceremony for our remarkable members of the AAPI community who have dedicated their lives to being leading voices in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. I would like to introduce our president and CEO, Dr. Leone H. Madison, for our welcome. Hello, everyone. Good night, good evening, and wherever you are online, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Let me grab my notes here. We are grateful that each of you here this evening from the AAPI community have amplified your voice and the voice of the people that you continue to advocate for and serve. Honoring our valued AAI, AAPI community members give us here at Pacifica a sense of admiration and elevates our collective efforts towards equity and the desire to be at the forefront of such meaningful work and dialogue. If this is the first time that you're visiting our campus, let me also say a warm welcome to Pacifica Graduate Institute. It's always a pleasure to invite the community in. It's part of our uh, efforts towards cultivating a welcoming, diverse, equitable, and a culture that we all feel as if you're part of our soul family. Here at Pacifica, we talk about being part of a, the collective. And as our learners oftentimes say, when you come to Pacifica, you join a soul family. The grounds are sacred. You can feel it when you drove up on campus, correct? It's very sacred and it's very um, peaceful here. So I feel very honored to be part of this community and I'm grateful for your, the gift of your presence and your time this evening. So we also are grateful and thankful for all of you for being here and gathering uh, in such a momentous occasion to honor your contributions to the communities here in Santa Barbara County and beyond. To our honorees, our speakers, and friends and families who are here, 
thank you. Thank you for gifting and gracing us with your presence and time. Enjoy the evening, be present in the moment, and I hope that you will create a memory that will outlast you and I. So again, welcome to Pacifica Graduate Institute, and we're so honored to have you here with us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I would like to introduce to you our, our VP of Enrollment Management, Dr. Rika Toribio, uh, who will welcome our first speakers and honorees, uh, the Carl Young Center of the Philippines. It's good to see so many familiar and wonderful faces here. Magandang umaga, magandang hapon, magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. At um, maraming salamat po sa inyong pagdalo dito sa Pacifica Graduate Institute. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm here to introduce our first um, honorees and speakers for this evening. So I'd like to give a brief history first um, of Pacifica in the Jung Circle of the Philippines. So Pacifica and the Carl Jung Circle Center of the Philippines has had quite a history, but it wasn't until last year in May 2022 when we revitalized this relationship when Pacifica's former president, Dr. Joe Cambre, said, I'm going to meet with this Jung Circle of the Philippines. Maybe you'd like to come because I'm Filipino. Okay, so, all right, I said I, I, I'll show up, but um, what was supposed to be a formal uh, introduction and a formal meeting became a Chikahan session, like a, a gab fest, just a very informal moment of just getting to know each other. And apparently we know each other's relatives, titas and titos and family members. And it was because of that primordial cultural connection that propelled us towards this newfound collaboration, towards deep sharing and towards kapwa or community. Um, my husband is here, Shannon Terribio. He'll be speaking later, but yes, he's not here because he's my husband, but we do the same things. But um, so he and I have a seven-year-old American-born Filipino son, and we've always wanted to inculcate Gael with Filipino values and to understand his family's roots and traditions. And um, what I did was, well, Shannon had to stay here in the States, but I brought him to the Philippines last October uh, when he was six, and he met with our family, and I met with CJCC, the Jung Circle of the Philippines, who have now become my extended Jungian family, my soul family. For our son, it was a lesson in geography, immigration, ethnicity, and culture. Actually, he was quite befuddled when he landed in the Philippines, and he said, why are there so many Filipinos here? <laughs> so, um, I said, well, this is Filipino land. So that is how I explained how, where our families come from and that a lot of us have migrated here to the United States and we're all here together, all differences and similarities and we're all thriving here in, in this multicultural environment. And so with my lunch with CJCC, I was truly appreciative of what happened there because when you think of Jung, Carl Jung, C.G. Jung, we think about a very Eurocentric lens. We think about it as very theoretical in terms of, again, it's very Eurocentric Greek and Roman mythologies, and not really considering places like the Philippines or other Asian countries or everywhere else in the world to have anything related to depth psychology. So through the enormous efforts of our director of Pacifica Online, Laura Lee Scotch, she's joining us virtually from North Carolina and CJCC, we are proud to bring these endeavors to fruition through a series of offerings by CJCC through Pacifica Online. The first being our May 17 webinar on the Filipino myth of the drooling 10-headed being, insights into our lives of communication and change. So if you could please grace us again with your presence on May 17 virtually, and CJCC will be presenting. Uh, this ushers a new era in Pacifica, where we look again at depth psychology, not merely through homogeneously Eurocentric lens, but now to be able to conceive that depth psychology permeates through a multitude of cultures, traditions, 
and mythologies. So it is my deepest honor to welcome our first speakers and honorees for the evening. From CJCC, we have Dr. Rose Yenko, Chair Emeritus, Ruby Villavicencio Paorom, President of CJCC, and Jay Batun, to give us not only a glimpse of this 10-headed drooling uh, being, but of the beauty of the Philippines through the work of the Carl Jung Circle Center. So we welcome CJCC. Good day to everyone. Magandang gabi, magandang araw. Um, I am Ruby Kaurom, and as you know, I am not Rose Yanko, our chair emeritus, who is attending to some concerns, technically derived, actually. So I'm Ruby, and um, I'm, I'm going to present uh, what Rose is supposed to be sharing with you today. And I'd like to thank to Laura Lee Scott and certainly our dear president um, and um, Rika. Did you know that Rika is the niece of a classmate in high school who I danced, uh, entered the dragon with? That is uh, in our high school days. And Rika was just certainly um, uh, candid about the relationships that we had started with when we started engaging formally with Pacifica as a, as a uh, member of the community. And um, so it is, Truly an honor for me to share with you the Carl Jung Circle Center of the Philippines, as well as a bit um, and privileged to take the place of the the energies of this feisty lady, Rosemary Yanko, who started uh, Carl Jung Circle Center more than um, with its roots more than sixteen years ago. She's such an energy, she's such a warrior who in her later years, which are now, uh, she has from the warrior, she has transitioned to becoming a magician. A magician tending, tending the spirits and tending our souls who are with her in, in the study and furthering our growth with the principles of Jungian psychology. So let me present Jay. Also with me is Jay, uh, one of our members and officers who are with us in the workshops. And there is Jay. And uh, Jay would like to start our presentation. So the Carl Jung Circle Center is a learning center for Jungian and depth psychology. Um, it applies to person's individuation process. Please open the slides. Okay. Okay. Okay, next slide. That, thank you. And... Um, it stems from the early years of teachings of Rose Yanko at the Ateneo University's Psychology Graduate School. Um, and from there, she started organizing Friends of New Society with friends, Dr. Villasor, Dr. Bate, and Bernie Nepomuceno to join her teaching force. And this quaternity, as we should say, had been the driving force of a foursome through the many years um, with the various workshops and seminars that we have um, uh, had with CJCC. In 1995, the Jung Festival was organized as a major effort in launching Jungian psychology and the lectures were capped with a week-long lecture series by Catherine Asper, a union analyst from the Carl Jung Institute in Zurich. 
two books on Filipino unconscious and the Catherine Asper lecture series was also uh, was also produced in that. In the 90s, other advocates, friends, and supporters of Jungian psychology had come joined in. And like the Pied Piper, there were many other scholars as well as uh, practicing practicing um, um, psychologists as well as analysts who had come in and joined. All right. Um, Jay, at what point are you in now with your slide? I We are putting it out, slide number, I think, slide number four already. Yeah, so this... The Carlyon Circle Center aims to reach a number of to have a bigger psyche and soul to the potential of its gifts, its power, and its grace. And it seeks to awaken the passion for tending the psyche, the soul, the self. And it further seeks to spread the Jungian model of psychology as a psycho-spiritual bridge between what is important in our everyday life and what deeply touches both our minds and our souls. The Carl Jung Circle Center is a learning center for Jungian and the psychology as it applies to a person's individuation process, creativity, and spirituality, to the well-being of communities and institutions, and to the tending of our culture and our planet. So, uh, Ruby, you can continue now. Jay, I'd like you to request to uh, um, um, just uh, proceed and segue to your presentation on the Depth Institute of Asia that we have uh, that we have formed. Just okay. okay, thank you. So, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Jay here, and maybe if you, I hope you can see me on screen, and I just to say something about the. CJCC. Our community, the Carlin Circle Center in the Philippines, is, was established in 2007. The momentum came from Rose Yang Post class in Ateneo de Manila from 2001 to, 2000, to 2010. Okay. Then the Friends of Jung brought Jung workshops to public and helped create this community, the Carl Jung Circle Center. So, um, what I said earlier, the vision is to awaken passion for tending the psyche, the soul, and the self. And so, and uh, in order to do this, we we do study sessions, organize public seminars, social media, soul conversations, art shows, and conferences. And we had an uh, original play, a stage play, musical in 2018, entitled uh, Halo Halo Tayo, the complex. Um, the call for the what's that again, Ruby? I, that, that, that subtitle was very the delicious and colorfully complex Filipino soul. The delicious and colorfully complex Filipino soul. Let's say a stage play musical that we held in 2018. And we interfaced with Pacifica since 2013 with Dr. Steve Eisenstadt. And Dr. Marin and Dr. Selig, and also Dr. Dennis Slattery as our faculty in the Kayaman course, and also in past conferences. And I'd like to move now, I'll say something about our dream school in our certificate course that we just recently concluded. And so, uh, all right, so I'm excited to announce that the Deaf Institute of Asia, our dream school, DIA, has been launched successfully last year. So the goal here is to tend students with in-depth appreciation of their inner richness. Individuals who hope to become dedicated soul workers aspiring to be catalysts of positive transformation within their respected spheres of influence. So uh, I think I have to share my screen so that you can see 
Mm. All right. So this is what I'm talking about, and I'm excited to inform everyone that our dream school, the Deaf Institute of Asia, has been successfully launched last year. Yeah. And to further actualize its mission, the DIA took a significant step by introducing its inaugural certificate course in August of the previous year, known as the Kayamanan, the Certificate Course on Deep Stories of Self. This immersive program spans over eight months, consisting of 24 days dedicated to unraveling and delving into the profound narratives that shape an individual life. So, and upon the completion of the Kayamanan course, our participants will embark on an ongoing journey of exploration, deepening, and revitalization of their lives through the lenses of Jungian and depth psychology. The individual then emerges or emerges as both the storyteller and the protagonist, delighting in the profound discoveries found within the depths of the self. So, the Kayamanan course encompasses three subjects, which you can see now on screen, with an average duration of eight days dedicated to each subject, involving six hours of study per day. Consequently, each subject consists of a total of 48 hours of instruction and engagement. And by completing this comprehensive certificate course, participants earn the equivalent of nine units, encompassing a total of 144 hours of intensive study, offering participants an enriching and extensive educational experience. Okay. So the Kayamanan is a hybrid class, and here are some screenshots of our Zoom sessions that you can see on screen. Yes, that's okay. And in the upper picture of the screen, is a photo of our graduation last April 15. And in the lower section shows our some of our graduates from ABS-CBN during our lunch get together last April 28. And here now is a, some, an actual, not a sample, but an actual certificate. And uh, the Deaf Institute of Asia is proud to inform that the first certificate course has produced a total of 24 graduates, 13 students, plus 11 reflection partners. So this is a photo of our actual certificate, and that's me. Thank you. And finally, being one of the graduates, I am pleased to show here a snapshot of my sole project as a final requirement of the course, and I call it La Divina Filipina, A Return to the Divine Family. Okay. So this is a, an embossed artwork made of textiles, beads, sequins, metals, fancy stones, and pearls, embroidered patches, applique, and digital printing. So thank you so much. And uh, I think at this point, I'd like to turn you over to Ruby Paolong, the current president of the Kanyon Circle Center. So Ruby, thank you. Yes, I'm back. Thank you, and for thank you so much, Jay, for that, and for sharing your soul project with that Divina Filipina image. So, um, my role for this segment is to share a bit about our webinar, which is uh, which has certainly been oh, beautifully described by uh, Laura Lee and her staff. Um, if it's about the drooling ten-headed being and the insights that we'd like to share with you on communication and change. But as I prepare for this, as I was preparing for this uh, short uh, introduction, I have come up with these letters, N-K-K-K-B. In our Filipino alphabet, these letters are pronounced N for not, and uh, and K for ka, all right? So put together, these letters form nakakakaba, which 
in our language means getting some jitters as this presentation is the maiden presentation of CJCC for our global audience and for you, our friends in Pacifica. And NKKB brings me to this bit of an anecdote about writing an elevator in the Philippines. Did you know that you can actually communicate about directions, whether you're going up and down an elevator with a single syllable, the syllable ba. And you're familiar with this, with Mary, who had a little lamb, which said ba, ba, black sheep. But I would be delighted if you can join me to say the syllables with this inflection. Ba, 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 ba. If you can actually join me, say ba, 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 ba. Everyone, Baba Baba in Filipino is a question to mean, is this going down? So if you're saying that to an elevator guy, um, he can answer with a shaking head or he can say, yes, it's going down. And he will answer you with this, Baba Baba. If you can repeat that with me, Baba Baba with that inflection. And that means, yes, it's going down. You see, it is possible for us to communicate in the Philippines with one syllable. Okay. So this morning, um, preparing for this, my husband had urged me over breakfast, why don't you share with oh, you know, the audience uh, that we can also communicate uh, with a facial gesture we can show the direction to where we're going with this. We point there. Where are you going to say that you're going there? All right. And um, hold on. I'm getting close to the myth. If you're a traveler in a mountainous area in the Philippines and we'd say you're going to the boondocks, as we say it. Boondocks, by the way, has its origin in the Philippines when the American soldiers were fighting the Philippine-American War, they fought it in the boondocks. In Tagalog, boondocks mean boondock. In Tagalog, we have boondock, and that is where the word boondocks came from. So if you're a traveler and you ask a native, is a place nearby? He can say, Yes, it's just there, but be careful. Being near is relative. It can mean hiking three mountains. And so our creation myth had come from the Bundas in Bukidnon province. It, is, it has this figure, the ten-headed being, as a top-built star. And a lot of us may be squirming in our seat. Uh, ten heads, imagine ten heads drooling with saliva, and you'd say, Ew, what's that? Ew. But surely this myth may have more to share with us beyond ew, and we may actually come out delighted with the stories and the twists and the turns in this myth. So, with this note, I enjoin you all to join us in two days on May 17 at 5 p.m. for this webinar. And with Rose and Jay, we thank you, the Pacifica community, for inviting us for this uh, sharing. We're truly honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Terribio and CJCC. Uh, we would now like to call upon Pacifica's Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Diane Travis Teague, to introduce our next speaker and honoree. Thank you, Corian. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of our Alumni Association, 
I join my esteemed colleagues in welcoming you this evening. It is my great honor to introduce to you my friend, our alum, Min Chan. Min graduated from Pacifica's MA Counseling Program in 2017. He received the Los Angeles County MFT Consortium Stithman Award for his clinical associateship and certificate in psychedelic assisted therapy and research. He became a licensed MFT in 2019. He is the Alumni Association's recipient of the Wendy DV Award for Service. He has contributed to many alumni panels, experience days, and events and was a member of the Executive Board for the Pacifica Graduate Institute Alumni Association. Will you please join me in welcoming Men Tra? Well, uh, the slides that I had sent in when they asked me to send some stuff in, really, you can pull them up, but they're just bullet points out of my CV. So I actually prepared a little speech that I brought on my laptop. And I'm opening at the moment. So while I do that, let me talk about, if you saw me earlier with um, Alma, my friend Alma Gabriela sitting over there beautifully, who is a part of um, the DPT program, our doctorate in depth psychology, specialization, integrative therapy, and healing practices. We are both doctoral um, candidates in that program. And we decided to do a little performance art pieces with our fashion statement around appropriation and representation and visibility and asking permission. And that was going to tie into what I was going to speak about, but on the plane, it turned into something else. So let me set my timer as an altar for my time complex because I like to respect your time. All right, let me read from my speech for you all today, this evening. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because it, it, it it's going to go over the bullet points, but it's it's in a way that like demonstrates more, delivers it in a way that's more of what I'm about these days. So, all right. When Googling how many words that is, does it take to read a 10-minute speech, Dr. Google answers 1,000 to 2,000 words. So, maybe um, I can read this speech in 1975 words. 1975, also the year in late April, of which an event known as the Fall of Saigon occurred, otherwise known as the liberation of South Vietnam, depending perhaps on which side brothers founded themselves fighting under which flag for. 1975, also the year that Critical Voice, chair of English department at USC and Pulitzer, winner, Pulitzer Prize winner novelist for his novel The Sympathizer, Viet Thanh Nguyen, became a refugee with his Vietnamese family and, be, um, and came to these United States at four years of age. Viet Thanh criticizes the American dream as the American branding for colonization. Now, I myself have had this sense um, and have articulated elsewhere something to the effect of the American dream is really carried um, on the backs of immigrants. It really is an immigrant's dream of America. In my first musical lecture titled America Dreams, Matriotism and Social Artistry, spotlighted by the LA County Psychological Association's Mirrors of the Mind Spotlight Series, a couple of years back, I opened with a performance of a Vietnamese song about boat people with the backdrop um, of images of Vietnamese boat people. Um, like Viet Thanh Nguyen, I too was a refugee who came to the US at four years of age. Alfred Adler might have been interested to know that my first memory was on an island refugee camp off the coast of Malaysia. Mm. I lost my place. Oh, there it is. My hour-long production, America Dreams, then moved into a critical voice and offered a feminist critique of Buddhism, the religion that I grew up rebelling against. Then, and however, segueing back into more dramatic delivery, I then played two roles in an acting bit with a character played by myself interviewing me. This in a perhaps more whimsical manner, but not unlike the Vietnamese communist double agent main character in Viet Thanh Nguyen's Pulitzer winning sympathizer, is also a how I convey to my audience an appreciation um, or maybe perhaps a, a sympathy for the splits within myself. Afterward, 
in an attempt to describe to myself what I mean by matriotism and social artistry, um, one of the disciplines of consciousness I describe in America Dreams, I talk about a type of critical appreciation. Critical voices like that of Viet Thanh Nguyen are, well, critical. Critical as in crucial. Now, I would like to turn my critical attention and voice toward appreciation onto a type of critical appreciation, a type of reflection which celebrates the suppressed, repressed, oppressed, a renaissance amidst revolution, a way of redemption, a push forward into the future by celebrating our past with all of its dark history amidst a perhaps necessary tear it all down, dare I say, devouring mother archetype activation period. It might be helpful to see my approach as a strengths-based or strengths-inclusive approach to psychotherapy with the culture. For following Pulitzer-nominated James Hillman in turning clinical attention toward the polis, um, my project these days on this little tour I'm having um, is about turning my clinical attention, my therapeutic attention, towards social engagements and transformation, and transformation thereby. For conversation is a transformative methodology, as we know, as actual psychotherapists, myself included, working day in and day out with people in suffering. And here again, I um, cite Viet Thanh Nguyen, who asserts, let there be narrative plentitude for voices that have been historically and systematically silenced. <laughs> And as I assert my voice, sometimes in song, um, in a manner which, going back to my first play, America Dreams, I described as a queering of entertainment and edification. Ocean Vong, a fellow queer Vietnamese American novelist, poet, MacArthur Foundation Award winner, aka the Genius Grant, um, says that a quality of queering something has to do with asserting ulteriority alternatives to existing paradigms, structures, concepts, and that following Ocean Vuong, the monolithic, heroic, American myth of the rugged individual who can pull themselves up by the bootstraps and conquer the new frontier is now requiring alteriority. For let's go back to the immigrants, not the ones from 1975 like Viet Thanh Nguyen or that of late 90s like myself or Ocean Vuong, but the ones in the waves of mass migration north at our southern borders right now, at this very happening. Those whose backs are still carrying the American dream. They come not for themselves. I mean, mostly they come to send money back to their families. I, I myself remember, I myself remember my own immigrant parents sending money monthly back to their families. For us, the American dream was never a story just about the rugged individual riding into the sunset. I think I'm feeling some emotion. That's why it's coming. To rightfully end on a rather ambiguous note, here is a Dionysian remix summary. In chronology, though, by James Hillman, um, in his piece, Joseph Campbell, Myth of the Hero. Here, one founding father of this graduate institute speaks on another. These passages selected can be found in volume 6.1 of Hillman's Uniform Edition. This is Hillman. <clears throat> to appreciate Joseph Campbell, we must stretch our minds. And the large comprehens from the large comprehensiveness of his undertakings, I want to select one particular, perhaps his most famous book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joseph Campbell followed the labors of Hercules in his servitude to scholarship, a forming with Sisyphean devotion. Perhaps the man, his deeds, the theme of the hero is most relevant to our country, our civilization, for its very continuation. This because the work of the hero, writes Campbell, is to slay the tenaciousness aspects of the father, dragon, ogre, king, 
and release the vital energies that will, fi- that will feed the universe. Who is the ogre? The reactionary aspects of the Senecs, who promotes fear, poverty, impoverishments, who tempts the young and devours the- them to increase his own importance. The ogre is the paranoid king who must have an enemy. The ogre is the sick king, a figure in myth, alchemy, and tribal rituals since the beginning of history. Civilization requires a hero myth. In fact, it is built upon that myth. The myth of the hero slays the ogre by revealing the pattern in the paranoia, the myth in the mess. But it is not the hero as such who slays the old king, it is the effect of myth itself. Not myth of the hero, but myth as hero. The heroic function of myth. This is the astounding gift Campbell has bequeathed our civilization. A mistake in my attacks on the hero has been to locate this archetypal figure within our secular history, after the gods had left and been banished. When the gods have fled or were declared dead, the hero serves only the secular ego, the force that prompts action, kills dragons, and leads progress becomes the Western strong ego, capitalist entrepreneur, colonial ruler, property developer, a tough guy with heroic ambitions on the road to success. I had lost the archetypal background in this secular foreground. Dr. Hillman, thank you. Today, we are honoring members of the AAPI community who have made significant contributions to depth psychology, mental health, service to the community, and diversity. And Mintron was our first award recipient. So thank you so much for being here, Min. He actually lives in Colorado, but came here and he is finishing up um, in the Integrative Therapy and Healing Practices program. So he graduated from our MA counseling psychology program and came back to get a PhD. So that should be a testament to our programs here. And we thank you so much for joining us. And so the first segment of this program is our speakers who are also our honorees. And then our second half of the program, we will be introducing um, our honorees. So our next speaker is my supervisor, mentor, and friend, uh, Dr. Rika Taribio. I can't say enough good things about her, but she is the Vice President of Enrollment Management at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, recently got promoted from Director of Admissions. Um, she has been my supervisor for four years, and I'm very fortunate to know her as a mentor. Um, she really sees everyone for who they are and um, honors their passions and what they bring to the table. So on the admissions team, when she has served as director for several years, she really brought out all of the good in us and saw what we all brought to the table. When I started at Pacifica, I was an admissions coordinator and she saw my passion for higher education, community psychology, and now I'm the director of admissions. And while that's probably a little bit from my hard work, it's also because um, Dr. Rika um, honored my path. She really mentored me, saw my passions. And, you know, while she um, she's analytical, she's smart, she has an EDD, she um, got her undergrad, <clears throat> and she has an MA as well. Um, and now she's Dr. Taribio. She is also just a kind, wonderful person. She's a mother. Um, when I met her, she was director of admissions and she was getting her EDD and um, I believe her son was three. So, I mean, I don't know how she has the time to do what she does. Um, and then there was a pandemic. So when she started at Pacifica, um, I believe maybe two weeks later, the pandemic hit. And so she brought our admissions team completely virtual and really oversaw how our team transitioned from um, what used to be in person to completely virtual. And so 
Um, when I think of Dr. Rika, you know, I don't just think of her as a supervisor. I think of her as a mentor friend, just amazing person. She, um, so she's going to be speaking today about um, Filipino Americans in higher education. And so she's a Filipina I immigrant. Um, and she moved here as an adult. And so she is going to talk about um, that kind of culture straddling being an American and Filipino woman and how um, so she did her dissertation on, you know, that kind of cultural strategy, uh, straddling. So she's going to be joining us today um, and she's our award nominee afterward. But um, I feel blessed that we get to hear her speak today because she does so much great administrative work, but she's also a scholar. And so it's really exciting to get to hear about her work. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Wow, <laughs> that was quite the, so much hype there coming up. But um, I am just so grateful to be here. And just like what Jessica said, um, probably for the past 15 years, my work has been predominantly looking at a spreadsheet, enrollment numbers, admissions numbers. And it's very rare that I actually get to talk about my scholarship and my research interests and how I am still truly looking at um, how Filipino students are, uh, the immigrant culture here in the United States, um, especially through the lens of a higher education um, administrator. And so, um, again, my name is Dr. Rika Taribia, and I am Filipino. Um, I was born and raised in the Philippines until I was 18. I moved here with my family 24 years ago. And even though I'm an American citizen, I do not identify as Filipino-American, as hyphenated. Um, because I have this cultural, ethnic, and primordial connection to my motherland, which is quite different from the experience of Filipino Americans. I see our seven-year-old son, he's, he's American born. And even though he understands my culture, we have those differences. But nevertheless, we are both going through this multiculturalism and this bicultural uh, straddling. So this presentation is about the paradoxical outliers. This is about the identity conundrum, identity development and conundrum of Philippine-born millennials. I focus on millennials. These are the ones who were born between 1981 and 94 because these are the ones who are currently in graduate education. Some of them are still in uh, their bachelor's degrees. But what we don't realize is that when these students, those who are born in the Philippines, when they enter these higher education institutions, it's for them to join a student organization, for example, of predominantly American-born Filipinos, it, it doesn't quite fit. So we just have to make sure that we disaggregate this information and we recognize and let everyone be seen for who they are if they're born here or born elsewhere. Next, please. So the issues here is that the identity conundrum is due to several factors, including the concepts of primordialism, which is your ethnic connection to where you were born and raised. Panethnicity, this stems from the 1960s when uh, during the civil rights movement, the American government just grouped together all these different um, ethnic groups for expediency and to name them. So they grouped all the Asians together, 40 plus countries. How do you group those all together and all these other ethnicities? And there's also cultural pluralism where immigrants are, have learned to appreciate their cultures while being American. And there's also neocolonialism because you'll hear later on about the history of colonization of the Philippines. And again, this affects Filipino uh, millennial identity. And now these issues are exacerbated in higher education institutions because as a higher education administrator, I see oftentimes that when you apply for college, which box do you check? There's usually about five boxes, Asian, white, black, et cetera. And there's five choices. Which ones do you choose? I don't know which one to choose if I'm Pacific Islander or Asian American because I'm in both. So those pan-ethnic groupings might have a consequence on financial aid, on uh, student programming, and that's why we do have to disaggregate this data. Next, please. 
So again, these were the four factors that could contribute to identity conundrum of a student here in the United States, especially those who are Philippine born. Next. Where did Filipinos come from? So again, my seven-year-old says, why are there so many Filipinos in Philippines? Because we came from there. When did we come to the United States? Years and years back. But there were three major waves of immigration that came to the United States. So the first one was in the early 1900s. These were the pensionados, the government scholars who were sent from the Philippines to study in the United States. And then they have to bring back their knowledge back to the Philippines. And then the second wave, they were requiring educated professionals, but also laborers in the farms. If you go to Hawaii, a lot of uh, Filipinos started there in the dole plantations. And here in California, we picked the asparagus. And then in 1965 onwards, there was a requirement that they had to be educated professionals. And this was a larger congregation of about 20,000 Filipinos were issued visas. In the Philippines also, we were colonized by Spain for almost 400 years. After Spain, the Americans supposedly came to liberate us, supposedly, but instead they stayed also for several decades. And that's why we speak English. But then our last names are all, <laughs> they call us the Latinos of Asia. Dr. Anthony Ocampo calls us the Latinos of Asia because we are, we have these last names, but then we speak like this. And so what happens when we move here to the United States? What happens to these students? We have this history of quietude, of subjugation, and we are not a people who would just easily advocate for ourselves. But what I saw from these students who were born between that age range of 81 to 94 is that when they came here, just like I did, around 18 or after they've spent years in youth in the Philippines, they are now advocating for themselves. Now they have a voice because now they understand that they must cohabit with other races and they are now more aware of their Filipino-ness and they embrace this more. Next, please. These are some of the voices that we heard. So this was a student in a school. So they said that, you know, they pulled me aside and they said, I should take ESL classes. And she said, why would I take ESL classes? Listen to me. I look how I speak. And then the banal and injudicious response to her was, oh, you speak English. And we get that a lot. We get a lot of, what are you? Where did you come from? Oh, you don't have an accent. So in the past, about 20 something years ago, our reactions would have just been, Haha. okay. So we chuckle and then we move on. But decades later, next please. It's, it's a different type of response. So this is another student who said, we are at a point in our lives that we don't have to conform. Years I spent changing my accent, but now I'm more comfortable with being Filipino. I am Filipino. And then another student said that, you know, in his higher education institution, there were dances. It was always a traditional dance that what they would show in these um, cultural showcases in school. There's the traditional tinikling, or wearing the bahag. And then this person said, they tried to capture that Filipino culture, but that's not how it truly is now. Because what this person was saying is that people in the West might think that in the Philippines, we still live in nipahats, or we're all fishermen, or we wear the loincloth. But... What I say now is, um, look at what I'm wearing. I'm wearing the traditional malong. I never thought I would, but I realize now that wearing my contemporary garb and speaking my contemporary language would not connect me from, with my heritage. So wearing this or having these traditional dances will demarcate me from what is contemporary and what is American. So this is my message of my Filipino-ness and finally accepting it after all these years of trying to change and being different and trying to look and feel American. But I'm not, I'm just Filipino. It would sound really strange for me to say I'm Filipino American because no, I was not born and raised here, but it's quite different now. So we do have that voice. So that's what I wanted to share today. Thank you.
and I get a crystal. And it's my honor to um, provide Dr. Rika Cheribio with our Community Service Award. Thank you, and I'm now excited to introduce our keynote speakers. So we have two speakers today, and um, they are going to share with us their great work on the Filipino Oral History Project. Um, I had the honor of attending an event where they got to present some of their research in archives, so it's great that we'll get to hear from them today. And we are also presenting them with uh, community service awards as well. So I would like to introduce our two keynote speakers from the Presidio Research Center at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. So first, Shannon Terribio. He's another one of those people who you don't know how he has the time to do what he does. Um, he also has a young son and he is getting his doctorate in religious studies at UCSB. Um, and his work focuses on Southeast Asian and Asian American religion, new religious movements, ancestral traditions, and mysticism. Um, and he is the UCSB's Interdisciplinary Humanity Center's Public Humanities Fellow. And that is where he joined to do his work with the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation, who um, then did this project on the Filipino oral um, history archives. And then we also have our next speaker uh, joining us today, who is Des Alaniz. And they are the director of the Presidio Research Center at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, where I got to see this great presentation for the Filipino Oral History Project. Um, I hope you get a chance to visit sometime. It's really great. Um, we have library archives, and all their staff are really nice. I believe their director is here today. Um, they're all really nice, amazing people, so I hope you get a chance to visit. Um, Des has been working in the archives and different community collections for almost 10 years and is co-lead on the Filipino Oral History Project with Shannon Terribio. So I am excited for them to join us and share about their project. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Huge thanks to the Pacifica Graduate Institute staff for inviting us here to talk about this exciting project. Um, a lot of new and familiar faces here. Um, as mentioned, I'm Des Alanis. I'm the director of the Presidio Research Center. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about a project that has been going on for technically the last year, but with roots a lot going back a lot farther than that, actually. Um, so we are ready for our slides when those are available. Um, in order to introduce this project properly, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about the organization in which I work, the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. A uh, quick show of hands. Has anybody heard of the Santa Barbara Trust? I see a couple. Okay, awesome. I see some new, some new folks, too. <laughs> um, so the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. The Trust for Historic Preservation was founded in Santa Barbara. We're located downtown um, in 1963 by community leaders essentially to support historic preservation work in the county with specific focus on uh, downtown Santa Barbara and the area where the original Spanish Presidio Fort was constructed. Since its founding, however, though, in 1963, the Trust has grown our collections and programs substantially to focus on the highly diverse and multiracial communities which have flourished in the Presidio neighborhood throughout time. Besides in exhibits and museum spaces, our programs include other uh, year-round events. Uh, next slide, please. And apologies for some of the formatting. It looks like when we sent our slides and they didn't quite make it, but that's okay. Um, but some of the events that we have to celebrate our local communities include the Asian American Film Series, which is in its 14th year now um, taking place. Yes. Huge thank you to the um, Asian American Affinity Group that is responsible for curating and selecting those films. That'll be happening in July um, on, on each evening, each Friday evening in July. Excuse me. 
Um, but another excellent event that we have each year is the uh, Asian American Neighborhood Festival, which also takes place at the Presidio. Um, and this is an event that celebrates the many Asian American communities that have thrived in and around the Santa Barbara Presidio neighborhood. So my role as the archivist and librarian at the Trust has been to manage collections of historic maps, artifacts, books, uh, photographs, and other materials that comprise the collections of the Presidio Research Center. These materials have been donated by community members and local organizations and reflect the lived experiences of descendants and residents of Santa Barbara's multiracial communities. As an archivist, I work to document these materials and ensure their access to a wider public. The Filipino Oral History Project has grown from the strengths of the Research Center and the Trust in community-engaged oral histories and varied approaches to documenting and celebrating local history. Uh, next slide, please. As a couple of folks have already mentioned, um, there are sources dating the presence of Filipino sailors arriving with Spanish galleons as early as 1587 to the Central Coast. Um, however, the first documented Filipino to have lived in California was Antonio Miranda Rodriguez. Um, this, this gentleman was a soldado de cuera, a gunsmith and eventual um, iron worker at the Santa Barbara Mission. Miranda, we know about Miranda because Miranda was buried in the Santa, Santa Barbara Presidio Chapel in May 26, 1784. And we've pulled the image on the left here, which shows a plaque that was actually donated in 1986 by the Santa Barbara Filipino Community Association, which commemorates not just the incredible story of this individual, but also hints to the deeper ties between communities in the Presidio neighborhood and beyond. On the left side, you'll also see an altarpiece or herreros. Um, this is also in the Presidio Chapel on site at the uh, State Park. And this altarpiece was actually purchased with, uh, by the Trust with funds donated from the Filipino Community Association in the 1980s. And I bring these up not just because I'm a librarian and archivist and I love talking about stuff, but what's really more important is talking about the communities and the people behind the stuff that I have the privilege of um, keeping track of. However, besides these two items, the, the collection of materials by, um, that were donated by longtime members of the Trust and the FCA have made their way to the Presidio Research Center. However, up until recently, our collections did not really reflect the wider contributions and work of Filipino community members in Santa Barbara or the Central Coast more broadly. And this is a little bit where Shannon comes in. So, Thank you, Daz. <laughs> So I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to tell you more about the Oral History Project that uh, Des and I have started and why it's important for the local community. All right. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So before I begin, I would like to focus on our attention on, on, uh, on this image. Um, it's a building that many of you probably have seen already. It's on 425 State Street, located in downtown Santa Barbara. And you can see the, um, in front, it's, uh, it's a Thai restaurant, Zanyai. But there's also, under the sign, if you see it above um, the blue paint there, it says Filipino Community Building. And since the first time I came across this, uh, this place a couple of years ago, I've, I've always been intrigued about why there is such a sign there. Um, but very little information could be found about the, this Filipino community building and its history. But that's un, uh, that is until we started this oral history project. Right? But before I get into that, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background on how I got involved with the trust. Next slide, please. Okay. Back in 2020, I was awarded a fellowship by UCSB's Interdisciplinary Humanities Center and the program is called Public hum um, the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program. And what the program does is it fosters collaborations between scholars and communities to generate new knowledge and, and creative work to strengthen civic agency and cultural life. And the program included a practicum component so that fellows could actually be part of uh, such a collaboration. And last year, the trust accepted my application to do my practicum with them. And I mostly work with Daz at the, at the research center. And the trust served as, uh, as our collaborative space, not just between me, the trust, and Daz, but 
but also with the local community. And when I first started, I was assigned to, to interview Patty Van Tassel, um, a Filipino woman who donated some materials back in, um, uh, back to the uh, research center's collections way back in 2014. Next slide, please. All right, and since then, um, there wasn't an opportunity to revisit these materials. But then um, Kevin, our associate director of public engagement, he saw this opportunity when he came in since I have worked with Filipino American history, um, as well as my interest in doing public history and um, archival work. And he said, hey, why, why, don't, you, why don't you interview Patty? And, and so I was uh, thrilled with, that, with the idea. So um, we invited Patty for a series of interviews. And, and that's pretty much how, um, that's pretty much what oral history is, right? People talking about um, their personal history, their family's history. And, and upon looking at Patty's materials, right, such as the ones featured in the slide um, showing annual banquet programs and a souvenir from um, a commemorative event, featuring um, what Des just mentioned, the Tonya Miranda Rodriguez. And so uh, upon looking at these materials and talking to Patty, um, as well as, you know, other oral history interviewees, um, I found out that there has long been a Filipino community in Santa Barbara. And many of our oral history interviewees have family members that can be traced back from, from a century ago. And through these oral history collections, we learned that the building that I just showed you earlier, uh, it was purchased by the Filipino Community Association, or the FCA, in 1955. And it has been a significant site for social and civic gatherings for its members ever since. And, and as we interviewed more people, we came to realize that the FCA is only part of of the larger Filipino American community across the Central Coast. From our community partners and collaborators, we have then been gathering more contacts for potential interviews, and our list of contacts just keeps on growing. And uh, we're inviting more of our community members to partake in this project. So that's, that's how the Oral History Project started. It's a collaborative effort between me and the Trust and the uh, Filipino American community. Next slide, please. So now, um, so why oral histories, right? Why do we need oral history? We already have uh, a lot of books about Filipino American history, right? Um, Dr. Treber already mentioned about the, the, three, um, the three waves of Filipino American migrations, right? And so... One of the many things I've learned from our conversations with our oral history interviewees is that history is not a monolith. And it's really from listening to people's stories that one would understand that. And, you know, I, I've read all the literature on Filipino American history, probably as, not as much as Dr. Turibio has. But, um, but it, it is still surprises me when I found out how much one could still learn about Filipino American history and more broadly about Asian American history, about Santa Barbara's history, about the Central Coast's history, just from listening from, you know, these oral histories. Learning about local history turns the grand patterns of historical change into concrete stories that tell us about the lives of individuals, Collective histories deepen people's sense of community, which encourages them to gather and come together. But to really understand the community's shared history, we need to first know their individual stories. That is why oral histories are important, because they offer community members an outlet to tell their individual stories and allow them to be remembered for their individual and collective contributions to the community, while being acknowledged as a part of the fabric of our society. By, enab by enabling people to tell their families' histories, we empower individuals and their communities by allowing them to be authors of their own histories. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so our plan for the future, um, right now we're still doing ongoing interviews, interviews and digitization. We are still in the middle of processing and digitizing materials. Um, we are still scheduling and conducting oral history interviews. And we are inviting our community members to be part of this project. We also welcome comments and feedback from everyone. And we plan to soon have an exhibit to showcase what we and the community have been working on. And I'd like to take a second to not only once again thank our hosts here at Pacifica Graduate Institute, but also really sincerely to thank all of the donors and participants in this project. Um, this started with Patty, but it's now grown to involve a lot of folks who are really amazing folks and have been so generous with their time and generous with their story. So thank you so much. Some of y'all are here today. Some of y'all might be watching, but can we really quickly a round of applause for our participants? Thank you so much. So stay tuned for more updates um, if you're interested in learning more about this project or how um, how to get involved. Please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you once again for your attention and for this event. Thank you and congratulations to all of our speakers. And now we would also like to honor these individuals uh, who have served the AAPI community. Please welcome again, Jessica Rubenstein and Diane Travis Teague who will introduce these honorees. Um, thank you so much. So may I first um, actually, um, invite up Dr. Lee, our president and CEO. She would like to present the award to Mona Miyasato. Thank you. I asked for you to be moved up because <laughs> you are the CEO of the county. And I am just so honored that you took the time out of your very busy schedule to be with us and all of you here, but she's a CEO of the county, y'all. So uh, I have had the distinct honor and pleasure of working with um, Mona. She's my shero, and she knows it. And um, <laughs> uh, Mona Miyasato is an implementer, a transformation agent, a strategist, and a get it done leader. And she's responsible for um, policy direction of the Board of Supervisors. She provides countywide strategic leadership and currently supports various county departments. In fact, 23. I'm not sure if the county has shrunk since I was last there. I, I doubt that's the case. But she supports various county departments such as the sheriff, the fire, uh, district attorney's office, public works, and so much more. Um, Mona previously worked as chief assistant county. I don't even know why we're saying that. That's just years ago. Mona is just for Santa Barbara. She's been here for many years doing an amazing job at the county. It is such a distinct pleasure and honor to just recognize you for all the great work that you've been doing across the county. Before, at the height of the pandemic, I interviewed Mona. So Mona was responsible for said in the county strategic direction, which is called Renew 22. And when we started that process, we're looking like, are you sure we're going to get through this? Right. You remember? And <laughs> and now we're beyond Renew 22. And we kept saying, but what are we going to do after 22? Now we're at 2023 and the county has transformed in amazing and just beautiful ways. And we just want to thank you and honor you for your um, tenacity, the resilience and the leadership that you bring to the County of Santa Barbara. So let me honor you by uh, extending this Pacifica Award to our CEO, <laughs> Master. Thank <laughs> you so much. You too, too. Oh, we used to do our yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I oh, miss you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then if we could please also um, invite back up for a moment our guests from um, the Presidio Research Center. We are also honoring them with this award. And we also wanted to um, mention... Sarah Faniga, who is also from their staff, who could not um, be here with us today. Yeah. 
And now as we transition into the rest of our awards for the evening, again, we are honoring AAPI members of the community who have made significant contributions to depth psychology, mental health, diversity, higher education, and service to the community. These are just outstanding, inspiring individuals. Um, I'm honored to present um, another award to another one and my mentor, she is joining us virtually um, via Zoom. Her name is Dr. Alma Trinidad. Um, you can see her on the screen. So um, I actually met Dr. Trinidad in my undergrad when I went to Portland State University. Um, and I was a teaching assistant mentor in her race and social justice class. Um, and so she was a mentor of mine for many years. Um, fast forward several years later, I was working here at Pacifica Graduate Institute, maybe that must have been 10, 12 years later. And I was having lunch um, in the dining hall and I saw her and I kind of blinked. I was like, am I imagining how could this be possible? Because I went to school in Portland State in Oregon. And so I went up to her, gave her a hug and it was just such an out-of-body experience because we knew each other in Oregon. Um, so it turned out that she was teaching in Pacifica's Community Liberation Indigenous um, and Eco-Psychology program. Um, and so Dr. Trinidad, she is um, the current um, chair for the um, social work program um, at Portland State University. Um, she has her PhD in social work um, from University of Washington. She considers herself a scholar warrior of Aloha. Um, she's a um, Filipino woman who deeply cares about social justice and advocating for the AAPI community. So I am thrilled to make all of these wonderful connections at Pacifica. We talk about synchronicity, and so that was one of those moments. Um, so she will be getting her certificate in the mail, but I am excited to present her with her award virtually. Did you want to say a word or two, Dr. Trinidad? Yes, I'm um, Good evening, everyone. I'm hailing from Portland, Oregon. This is such an honor and pleasure to receive this award. Thank you, Jessica and um, the Pacifica family for thinking of me. It's been a while since I've taught there, but know that my work there has been transformative for myself as a scholar and a professor because I was invited at a time when I was also grappling with issues in higher education. Um, but nevertheless, I look forward to um, what we can do together to continue to transform um, the world. Thank you so much. And our next honoree, is Wing King Wong, JD. She is an attorney, she, I'm sorry, she is attorney mediator um, and Pacifica Graduate Institute alumni. Are you here today, Wing King? <laughs> and Wing King came all the way up from LA, so we thank you for making that drive. Um, next, I'd like to honor uh, Patricia Montemayor, who I met um, during the Filipino um, Oral History Project event at the Presidio Research Center. She contributed to that project, and she is the former Santa Barbara County Affirmative Action Officer. Um, she served in that role for many years and is now retired um, and has been a great advocate for uh, diversity and social justice. Next, I wanted to honor Patty Van Tassel, who I also met uh, during the event for the um, Filipino Oral History Project, and she uh, greatly contributed to that project. Oh, wow. Let's see. And Patty is such a nice, wonderful human who has contributed uh, to that project and shared about um, her family members and contributed to the archive. Um, next, 
who uh, who is also joining us virtually um, is Dr. Leisha Shui, who is the director of the Global Education Institute at California Polytechnic University in Pomona. She is joining us virtually, so if you wanted to say a word or two. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I, I feel uh, extremely honored to be um, the recipient recipient of this uh, uh, award. Actually, I just traveled to uh, Manila, the Philippines, uh, two months ago. Had a great time there. We uh, joined the event organized by the U.S. Embassy. We met uh, over uh, three hundred uh, Philippine K uh, twelve students and their parents. Uh, it's really a great trip. And I really enjoyed today's program. Um, it's very powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists who joined us virtually. It's so nice to see your faces, even on screen. Our next award is to the Carpinteria Masonic Lodge, number 444. I'd like to say something else. Our name is grouped into those other recipients. We don't have PhDs, we don't have MAs, but we do contribute to the Carpentria community. Thank you very much for this award. Our next honoree is Dr. Rudy Busto, who is the Associate Professor and former Chair of the UCSB Department of Religious Studies. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Roycevich, who is going to be introducing our next honoree. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here with all my colleagues, but with such people of, of extreme consequence from the uh, uh, Asian American and uh, community. So thank you for being here uh, tonight. You honor us with your presence. I'm honored to introduce the next honoree, Dr. Jane Naomi Iramur. She is currently a chief academic officer and professor of religious studies at University of the West, where formerly she was chair of religious studies department and the inaugural director of the Institute of Humanistic Buddhism. Her scholarly research focuses on Asian American religions, race, and popular culture in the United States, with emphasis on visual culture. Dr. Aramura's publications include The Highly Influential Virtual Orientalism, Religion, and Popular Culture in the U.S., published by Oxford University Press. Also, Revealing the Sacred in Asian and Pacifica and Pacific America, a volume that she co-authored and released by Rutledge. She has taught with distinction courses in Asian American studies and religious studies and has received awards for her teaching and mentoring of University of Southern California and U.S. West students. Dedicated to the study of Asian American Pacific Islander religions and the role that religion and spirituality play in the mental health and well-being of Asian Americans. Dr. Iramura is co-founder of the Asian Pacific American Religions Research Initiative, the APARRI, and has helped maintain that initiative for over 20, 25 years. Because of her substantive role in APARRI, it has been crucial in establishing the field of, American, of Asian American religions. How many people can say they were crucial to establishing a role, like a whole field, that's Dr. Jane. And through its broad interdisciplinary network of historians and sociologists and theologians and pastoral care practitioners and mental health scholars and community activists whose collective work has contributed to the public understanding and recognition of religion and the everyday life of Asian Americans. 
Dr. Iremura's exceptional accomplishments in scholarship and teaching, along with her work with the APARI and the American Academy of Religion and the Association for the Asian American Studies, have been instrumental in championing the AAPI community. On a more personal note, to know Jane is to be schooled from moment to moment in integrity, discernment, compassion, and unfaltering professionalism. Jane is truly an authentic jewel gift to us tonight who gather uh, to recognize her as well as the other honorees and a jewel gift to any, everyone who has had the opportunity, as I have, to work with her and call her friend. Congratulations, Jack. Yeah. And next, I'd like to introduce our president and CEO, Dr. Leonie Madison, once again. It's my honor to recognize and appreciate Wade Namora, our current Carpinteria City Council member who has been on the City Council for 10 years, including four as mayor and 18 years serving on the Architectural Review Board. Wade was appointed for two consecutive terms as mayor, which has never happened in the last 50 years prior. He has served as general contractor for building the 1.2 million Tomol Interpretive Playground, the chair of the Boys and Girls Foundation, and the president of the Santa Barbara chapter of Japanese American Citizens League for 20 years. Wade also is a, has a huge amount of humanitarian work in developing countries primarily bringing water to those in less fortunate um, countries such as Latin America, given that he is also bilingual in Spanish. He's also playing a key role in the Anwash Haiti, a multi-billion dollar, multi-decade program to bring water to the entire country of Haiti. So it's an honor to recognize your contributions to the city of Carpentry and around the globe. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you. Um, there are some comments I would like to make. First of all, um, I really appreciate this award uh, on behalf of all Asian Americans. I would like to say that um, I have a Japanese uh, descent. My parents, my grandparents were interned during World War II which um, made it pretty tough for us to get through. We faced a lot of prejudice at that time. To this day, we still face that one. So uh, we are fighting for that one. I think one of the reasons why we push so much harder is to make sure that we have that positive image uh, within the community. I would also like to say um, we got a ways to go yet. Um, one thing that I found, you've heard that we had a district voting within the city of Carpinteria. I was uh, on the council at that time. I was uh, the only minority. And when the um, lawsuit came forward, the lawyer said, well, um, you guys are all white, all white council. I go, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not quite white. I don't quite fit. Their response was, it's because uh, you don't count. You're a super minority. So <laughs> we do have ways to go. And a um, little choked up only because I appreciate all the work that each and every one of you have done. It makes a difference um, as we start elevating in society with all the great work we do. That's what we'll be noticed and identified. Thank you. Well, guess what? Can I tell you something to you? Sure. Well, you all think you're a minority. I'm black and I'm Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> At this time, I'll also like to call forward and honor Teresa Chin. Is she still here with us? Okay. Teresa has been part of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation and has been a leader of the Asian American Neighborhood Festival and Asian American Film Series as part of the Trust. With over 35 years of experience in the financial services, Ms. Chin, who started her career at Merrill Lynch in Ann Harbor, 
Michigan, specializes in personal trust and trust real estate management and is responsible for administration of testamentary trust, investment agencies, and charitable foundations. She has a JD from Santa Barbara College of Law and is a certified ESL instructor at Santa Barbara City College continuing education program for over 10 years. She currently serves as co-chair of Asian American Affinity Group for the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation and several committees nominating and development. And I must share with you a little secret. Um, your nomination came from our CEO. Oh, yes. I had to give that secret away. We're, we're so honored to honor you. Thank you for all of your work. And again, thank you for all of the work and contributions that all of you, you matter. We're not looking for PhDs and MAs and BAs to only set sail and set your sights here at um, Pacifica. We truly are open to the entire community. It's our way of cultivating a diverse, equitable, and welcoming campus culture so that when you come here, you want to stay here, not forever though, but we want you to we want you to keep coming back and supporting the work of Pacifica and let us know how we can support your personal transformation as you navigate your life journey. So thank you for all the work that you do in our community. Would you like to say something? Thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge um, Alex Tang, who is one of the co-founders of the Asian American Association of Santa Barbara County. I also like to acknowledge Helen Wong, who's one of the co-founders of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation Affinity Group. We've been together for 15 years now. So, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity to bring uh, together our community and to make all these connections that matter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Finally, we honor these individuals as they truly have elevated the AAPI community, but unfortunately could not be with us this evening. Uh, we want to honor Catherine Bailey. Catherine is Pacifica's Executive Admissions Advisor, and she has served with Pacifica for a number of years. So we want to honor Catherine. Uh, we want to go ahead and honor Dr. Anthony Christian Ocampo, uh, who is uh, a professor of sociology at California State Polytechnic University, uh, Pomona. So we want to go ahead and honor him as well. And finally, we want to honor Roy and Tina Lee. Uh, Councilman Roy Lee, a small business owner and the current member of the Carpinteria City Council, has served in the council since 2018. Uh, so we just want to go ahead and give them a round of applause. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and in closing to this momentous, beautiful evening, uh, if you could turn to your right or your left and say thank you uh, to your fellow guest that is here. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. That is our AAPI celebration. Let's give it a round of applause. Yes. Thank you all. <laughs>